This is Dr. Hana Asil, and this is paper 2CR of June 2023 in the Pearson Edexcel IGCSE. So let us take a look at the questions and discuss the answers. The first question in this paper was the table lists three subatomic particles. Remember, subatomic particles refer to the particles inside the atom. So these are protons, neutrons, and electrons. And we're supposed to complete the table to show the mass of a proton and mass of a neutron. What is the mass of a proton? You should know that a proton is given a mass of 1. And neutrons have the same mass, so also a mass of 1. Now, the charge on a proton is plus 1. What is the charge on a neutron. You should know that neutrons are neutral and that means their charge is zero. Now the mass of an electron, we write it as 1 over 1840 or this number which is 0 0.0005, a very small mass. What is the charge on the electron? It's minus 1. You know that the electron is negatively charged. We say that the charge is minus 1. The diagram shows the position of some elements in the periodic table. Use the periodic table on page 2. Of course, you know that in your exam, you have the first page of the exam is the periodic table. Use it to help you answer this question. So we have a periodic table. How are elements arranged in the periodic table? You should know that elements are arranged according to what? According to increasing atomic number, not mass number. Increasing atomic number. So we start from hydrogen, atomic number one. Helium, atomic number two. Lithium, three. Beryllium, four. Boron, five, and so on. So we arrange the elements in the periodic table according to their atomic number. Which statement is correct about the position of phosphorus in the periodic table? Now we look at the periodic table. We look for phosphorus. Can you see where phosphorus is? You know that the groups are the vertical columns. The periods are the horizontal rows. So phosphorus is in group what? Can you see group what? It's in group 5, period 3. Explain which of the four elements in the diagram is least reactive. Of course, when you look at the periodic table, the one that is least reactive is the one that is in group 0, which we refer to as noble gases. So the one that is least reactive is xenon. But if we say explain, Explain why xenon in this choice is the least reactive. Remember that anything in the group zero or noble gases has a full outer shell of electrons. And that is why we say it is unreactive or inert. Question two shows the table gives some information about halogens and we are required to complete the table. And you should know this information about the halogens. You should know the color of the halogens and the state of the halogens. So you should know that fluorine is what? Fluorine is a yellow gas. Chlorine, a green gas. What about bromine? Bromine is a red-brown liquid. Remember that bromine is the only liquid non-metal. And, of course, iodine is a gray solid. Describe a test to show that a colorless liquid is an alkene. What do we mean by alkene? Alkene means it has a double bond. What was the test for alkenes? Remember, the test for alkenes was add bromine water it turns from orange to colorless a student is given an aqueous solution of chlorine and an aqueous solution of sodium iodide 
the student mixes the two solutions, explain the color change. That means you need to tell, tell them what happens to the color and why. Many students forget the explain part. Okay, so if we look at group seven, so chlorine, of course, and iodine and bromine, all of these are in group seven, they are halogens. Which one is the more, more reactive halogen? the one that is on top. So fluorine is more reactive than chlorine. Now, in this question, we have chlorine with sodium iodide. Of course, chlorine is more reactive than iodine. So the chlorine will displace the iodine. And that means the original solution, which was sodium iodide, was colorless. Sodium iodide is colorless. It's a compound of group one so it doesn't have any color but when we add chlorine gas to it then the chlorine is more reactive than iodine it displaces the iodine so now i have iodine in solution and you should realize that iodine in solution is a reddish brown or we could refer to it as a brown solution so the solution turns from colorless to brown because Chlorine is more reactive than iodine and displaces it. Question three gives a list of some metals and we are told use words from the box to identify the metal that burns with a bright white flame. Which of these would burn with a bright white flame? You have to know that the metal from these choices that burns with a bright white flame is magnesium. Remember when we talk about flame tests, magnesium does not give a color. It gives a bright white flame. Now explain which metal is most likely to be found in the earth as an uncombined element. What do we mean by uncombined element? That means I can dig up and find the metal as it is, and that means it is not reactive. Because if a metal is reactive, you cannot find it uncombined. So we're looking for which of these is the least reactive. So if we look at the electrochemical series, you should realize that out of all these choices, the one that is least reactive is gold which is au so gold is the least reactive so that is the one that is most likely to be found in the earth of course silver also is not reactive so we could find silver but the question says the one that is most likely to be found uncombined so out of these choices it is gold Steel is an alloy of iron and carbon. State what is meant by the term alloy. What do we mean by alloy? Alloy is a mixture of metals and other elements. So it could be metal with metal or metal with something like carbon. So we say it's a mixture of metals and other elements. Explain why an alloy is less malleable than a pure metal. Remember, if we're asked, why do we use alloys and not the pure metal? We say because the alloy is stronger, harder, less malleable. Now, why is that? Because we have atoms of different sizes. Remember that a metal is supposed to have regular rows of positive ions. But if we have an alloy, then we have atoms of different sizes so this prevents the layers from sliding over each other easily. And that is why alloys are harder, stronger, less malleable. Question four says the diagram shows a fractionating column used to separate crude oil into fractions. Give one use for refinery gases and one use for bitumen. Remember that we have this. The crude oil goes into a fractionating column and we are required to know the order in which the products are formed and the uses of each one. So we're asked about what? Refinery gases. You should realize that refinery gases are used as bottled gas and this is used as fuel for heating and cooking. 
What do we use bitumen for? Where is bitumen? For road making or road surfacing. Give a reason why refinery gases rise to the top of the column. The one that goes up to the top of the column is the one that has what? It's the one that has less carbons, low boiling point, less viscous, more flammable. So why does the refinery gas go all the way up? This is because this is the one that has lower boiling point. Remember the one with lower boiling point is collected at the top. Now state what must happen to the crude oil before it is pumped into the column. What do they do to the crude oil before it goes into the fractionating column? It is heated and vaporized. Then it goes into the fractionating column and then it is cooled and condensed at different boiling points. There is a low demand for some of the hydrocarbons obtained from crude oil. Now, catalytic cracking can be used to convert low demand hydrocarbons into more useful products. And the first question is, give the conditions needed for cracking. Do you remember what's cracking? Cracking is the breakdown of long chain hydrocarbons into shorter chains. Now, what are the conditions? We said we use aluminum oxide catalyst and 600 to 700 degrees Celsius. The cracking of tetradecane is shown in the equation. Explain why there is a high demand for both of the products. Remember that uh, cracking is important in industry because it gives uh, products with less number of carbons or smaller molecules. Now, why is that good? Because the products would include alkenes, which are used to make polymers. So I can use the alkene that is produced in the product to make a polymer or to make alcohols. And the shorter chain hydrocarbons, so breaking up C14 to C8, for example, the shorter chain hydrocarbons are more flammable. So they are used as fuel. So we burn them to release energy. And remember, complete combustion of any hydrocarbon gives carbon dioxide plus water and it releases a lot of energy. Question five is about the insoluble salt, lead bromide. Lead bromide can be made by precipitation reaction. Do you remember what's precipitation reaction? This is the method of making a salt that is insoluble starting from two solutions. So to make lead bromide, I'm going to start with lead nitrate and potassium bromide solutions. Describe how these solutions can be used to make a pure dry sample of lead bromide. So we're given lead nitrate solution, potassium bromide solution. What should we do? The first thing we do is add the solutions together in a beaker or in a flask and stir. As soon as we add them together, they form a precipitate. So that is the lead bromide that we want. Now, how do I get that? We filter. So filter through filter paper and funnel. I'm going to remind you what do we want? The residue or the filtrate? The residue. I want the solid, the precipitate that formed. So I'm not going to do crystallization. I'm going to take the residue, not the filtrate, and wash with a few drops of distilled water and dry between filter papers. The question wants pure and dry. So we add the solutions, filter, the residue is what we want, the lead bromide solid. We wash that with a few drops of distilled water, dry between filter papers, and that's it. Please do not explain crystallization. A solution containing 0.15 mole of lead nitrate is reacted with excess of potassium bromide. So we're still talking about this reaction. We added 0.15 mole of lead nitrate with excess potassium bromide. A mass of 49.6 grams of pure lead bromide is produced. So this is the mass that they got 
when they did the experiment in the lab show by calculation that the percentage yield is 90.1 percent now in order to determine the percentage yield i have to calculate what is the theoretical yield what is the mass that they should have obtained so from the number of moles of lead nitrate i look at the equation and i find that that would be the same as the number of moles of lead bromide remember the equation gives a one-to-one -one ratio between lead nitrate and lead bromide and that means the number of moles of lead bromide is the same as the number of moles of lead nitrate we started with then we can calculate the mass that we should get the mass is number of moles times mr we're already given the mr please don't waste time and to calculate the mr so from my calculation, we were supposed to get 55.05 grams. Now, how much did they actually get? They got 49.6. That means the percentage yield is the 49.6, which is the actual yield, over the theoretical yield that we calculated. So we were supposed to get 55.05 times 100 and that means this yield is 90.1 percent a student investigates the change in electrical conductivity as dilute lead nitrate solution is added to potassium bromide solution so as we add the dilute lead nitrate to dilute potassium bromide we measure the electrical conductivity so they put 50 centimeter cubed of potassium bromide in a beaker measured the electrical conductivity and then added 10 centimeter cubed of lead nitrate stared measured and repeated until the total volume of lead nitrate added was 50 centimeter cubed and this is the student's results now we are required to plot the student's results and draw a line of best fit so this is the graph we were supposed to plot we plot the points and we draw a line of best fit ignoring the anomalous result can you see the point that's away from the line that is the anomalous result and we do not include it in the line so looking at the graph here the question says explain the shape of the graph now as we can see what is happening as the volume of lead nitrate increases what is happening to the electrical conductivity it decreases and of course he's saying explain of course this is what would happen because as we add more and more lead nitrate then more of the ions will form a precipitate so they will come out of the mixture and form a precipitate and that means there will be less ions in the mixture to conduct electricity so just a mistake the student could have made to cause the anomalous result what could he have done wrong to get a point away from the curve like this he got a point that is higher than it should be well that means either the mixture was not stared remember if we are uh, measuring temperature or if we're measuring something like electrical conductivity then we're adding two solutions we should stare them uh, so that we make sure that what we get is correct or not enough time was given for the reaction to occur uh, he measured the electrical conductivity before uh, giving it enough time for the reaction to happen. Further 10 centimeter cubed volumes of lead nitrate are added so the lead nitrate becomes excess. So now I have more and more lead nitrate that is not being used and that means that I have more and more ions so the conductivity would increase since more ions are in solution if we're adding a lot of lead nitrate it is excess then it remains in solution it's not forming precipitates and that means the ions in solution would be more and more so conductivity would increase 
The diagram shows electrolysis of molten lead to bromide. This is the ionic half equation for the information for the formation of bromine. Give a reason why this half equation shows oxidation. Why do we say this is oxidation? What is oxidation? Remember, oxidation is loss of electrons. So, this equation is oxidation because bromide, not bromine, bromide ions lost electrons. Describe the forces of attraction in metallic bonding. Remember, a metal is made up of what? It's made up of regular rows of positive ions surrounded by a sea of delocalized electrons. So, the metallic bonding is the strong attraction forces or strong electrostatic attraction forces between the positive ions and the delocalized negative electrons. When a small piece of potassium is added to water, bubbles of hydrogen gas are observed. First, give the test for hydrogen gas. What is the test for hydrogen gas? Yes, insert a lighted splint, it pops. Remember, lighted, not glowing. Glowing is for oxygen. Insert a lighted splint, it pops, or it goes off with a pop. When a small piece of potassium is added to water, bubbles of hydrogen gas are observed. Give Two, so, he's, he already mentioned bubbles, so don't say bubbles. We put potassium in water. We're going to have bubbles of hydrogen gas. That's fine. Give two other observations. Remember, when we put potassium in water, first of all, when we were talking about sodium, we said sodium will give off bubbles of gas that may catch fire. But potassium is more reactive than sodium. So, potassium would catch fire. And remember that when potassium burns, it gives a lilac flame. So, what is observed is a lilac flame. And, of course, we said all group 1 float on surface of the water. And as it reacts, the piece of potassium solid becomes smaller, or we say it melts or it disappears. So, these are the observations other than formation of bubbles of gas. Explain why lithium is less reactive than potassium. Remember we said as we go down group 1, the one down is more reactive than the one up as a metal. Now, reactive as a metal means it can lose its outermost electron more easily. Remember, when we say a metal is more reactive, that means it can lose that outermost electron more easily. So, why is potassium more reactive? Or why is lithium less reactive? Remember, lithium has only two shells. So, the outermost electron is very near to the positive nucleus. Strong attraction forces between the outermost electron and the positive nucleus. So, the lithium will not be able to lose that outer electron very easily. While if we look at potassium, potassium has more shells, the outermost electron is further away from the nucleus, so uh, less attraction forces between the outer electron and the nucleus, and this means that the potassium will lose that outermost electron more easily, and that's why we say potassium is more reactive. This is the equation for reaction between sodium and water. Now, a mass of 0.75 grams of sodium is reacted with excess water. Calculate the volume of hydrogen gas produced. Okay, so we have a certain mass of sodium. Remember, when we have all any of these questions about calculations, we're given a certain information about one of the reactants. So, we have mass of sodium, we get the number of moles of sodium. How do we get number of moles when we're given mass? It's mass over molecular mass. So, now we have number of moles of sodium. Then, we look at the equation and relate the number of moles of sodium to the number of moles of, what is he asking about? Hydrogen, 
Well, from the equation, it says two moles of sodium would give one mole of hydrogen. And that means number of moles of hydrogen is half of whatever we have for sodium. So the number of moles of sodium divided by two, that would give the number of moles of hydrogen. Now, what are we asked to calculate? Volume of hydrogen. How do we get volume of a gas? Number of moles times 24. But we want that in centimeter cubed. So multiply that by 1,000. So that gives 391.2 centimeter cubed. Have we finished? The question says, give your answer to how many significant figures? Three significant figures. So I cannot leave it. 391.2, three significant figures means my answer is 391 centimeter cubed. This is the equation for reaction between sodium hydroxide and sulfuric acid. And we are told a volume of 25 centimeter cubed of sodium hydroxide is completely neutralized by this volume and this concentration of sulfuric acid. Calculate the concentration of sodium hydroxide. Again, what do we have for information? We have volume and concentration of acid. I can use that to get the number of moles of acid. So number of moles when we're talking about a solution is concentration times volume. And remember the volume has to be in decimeter cubed. So the volume of the acid, I divide by a thousand. This gives the number of moles of acid. Then we look at the equation. We're asked about what? We're asked about sodium hydroxide. And the equation says, two moles of sodium hydroxide react with one mole of sulfuric acid. And that means the number of moles of sodium hydroxide is twice the number of moles of acid. So I just multiply the number of moles of acid by two. That gives the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. And then what are we required to calculate? Concentration of sodium hydroxide. How do we get concentration? Concentration is number of moles over volume, and the volume was 25 centimeter cubed. I have to divide that by 1,000 before I put it into the equation, and this gives me the concentration of sodium hydroxide. Please practice all of these calculations. Now, question 7 says, methanol is made by reaction between hydrogen and carbon monoxide. And we're given the equation and we're told that the delta H is a negative value. Remember, if we have a reaction and delta H is negative, that means the forward reaction is exothermic. A mixture of hydrogen and carbon monoxide is left until dynamic equilibrium is reached. This reaction is a reversible reaction. So give two characteristics of a reaction at dynamic equilibrium. Remember we said a reversible reaction is one that goes both forward and backward until it reaches dynamic equilibrium. What do we mean by dynamic equilibrium? The rate of forward reaction equals rate of backward reaction, or we can say the forward and backward reactions happen at the same rate. And concentration of reactants and products remain constant. Don't say they're the same. The concentration of reactants and products are not the same. They are constant, and that means the concentration of reactants remain constant, the concentration of products remain constant. Give a reason why adding a catalyst does not affect the yield. Remember, a catalyst is what? It's a substance that is added to a reaction to make it faster. And remember, if we're asked why does a catalyst ma make a reaction faster, we said because it um, provides an alternative pathway with lower activation energy. So a catalyst speeds up a reaction by lowering the activation energy. 
here we have two reactions happening. We have a forward reaction and we have a backward reaction. And when we add a catalyst to a reversible reaction, the catalyst speeds up both forward and backward reactions to the same extent. So it speeds up the forward and the backward equally. So it doesn't really favor forward or backward. So it would not affect the yield of the product. Then the question says the temperature of the reaction mixture is decreased. So we're going to lower the temperature. Explain the effect of this on the yield of methanol. So if we use a lower temperature, what happens? Remember the forward reaction here is exothermic. Lower temperature means the reaction will go to the side that is exothermic, which is forward. And when the equilibrium shifts to the right or the reaction goes forward, then we get more yield of methyl. So remember always lower temperature, reaction goes to the side that is exothermic. Then the question says the pressure of the reaction mixture is increased at constant temperature. Explain the effect of this change on the yield of methyl. So what are we doing? We're increasing the pressure. You should remember increasing the pressure causes the equilibrium to move to the side with less number of moles. So which side here has less number of moles? You should be able to know that going forward gives one mole of methanol. Going back would give two moles of hydrogen and one mole of CO. So increasing the pressure in this reaction causes the equilibrium to shift to the right or to go forward because this will give less number of moles and that means we will get higher yield of methanol. Then we're given this equation as displayed formula and we're required to do what? Show that the molar enthalpy change for the reaction is minus 119. How do we calculate delta H for this reaction? We look at the bond energies for the reactants, the bond energies for the products, and the delta H is reactants minus products. So let's take a look at the reactants. Before the arrow, we have what? We have two HH bonds. Each of them has 436 or needs 436 to be broken. So that is two times 436. Plus the C triple bond O needs 1072. So for breaking bonds in reactants, we need 1944 kilojoules. Now, what about the products? Which kind of bonds do we have in the products? We have three CH bonds, so that is three times 414. Plus, we have one CO bond, 358, plus one OH bond, 463. So the total for the bonds formed in the products, all of these will give out a total of 2063. The delta H is the difference of reactants minus products, and that comes out to the number that we're supposed to get. Explain why this reaction is exothermic. So when a reaction is exothermic, that is because the energy needed to break the bonds in the reactants is less than the energy released when bonds are formed in products, so more energy is released. So we say this reaction gives out heat or gives out energy, and that is why we call it exothermic. The diagram shows the displayed formula of an ester that is made from methanol and an acid, a carboxylic acid. First of all, draw a circle around the functional group of the ester. Where is the functional group of the ester? Remember, all esters must have that group, C double bond O, single bond O, something. So that is the function group of the ester. Now give the displayed formula of the acid used to make this ester. Where is the acid? Which part is the acid? It's the part on the left. 
So all of that you copy as it is, C double bond O, single bond O, H. So that is the carboxylic acid that was reacted with what? It was reacted with methanol. So the alcohol that we reacted uh, this acid with is methanol to give that ester drawn at the top. And that was the last question in this paper. I hope you understood all of this. Uh, please study hard and thank you for listening.